You are listening to The Real Men Feel Show with Andy Grant. Real Men Feel encourages men to allow and express all of their emotions. Despite what you may have been taught, all emotions do serve you. Real Men Feel is committed to engaging in discussions that most men aren't having, but you don't need to be a man to join us. The Real Men Feel Show is produced weekly for your growth and enjoyment. Listen to us on podcast platforms including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and many more. You can also watch the show on YouTube by visiting realmenfeel.org slash YouTube. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or subscribe on iTunes by visiting realmenfeel.org slash iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at realmenfeel.org and at facebook.com slash realmenfeelshow. All links mentioned in each episode are in the show notes found on the blog at realmenfeel.org. Real Men Feel is brought to you by The Good Men Project. Visit goodmenproject.com for more of the conversations no one else is having. Your reviews, comments, feedback, and participation are welcome during the live show and anytime in our Facebook group, on Twitter, or at realmenfeel.org. Now, let's get into this week's show. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Real Men Feel. This is your host, Andy Grant. You know, Re- Real Men Feel, if you've ever listened before, you may know this, but let me tell you if you haven't. Um, the show was created to remind men that we are human beings, and as human beings, we have the right, uh, and, and more than the right, the obligation, the duty to feel and own all of our emotions, not just the emotions you were taught were, were manly or not, not just emotions that, that are the easiest to express, not just the one or two that are your go-to, or, or perhaps none, perhaps you don't have any go-to emotions, which is uh, you know, even worse. But one of the challenges of, of owning and expressing and living with your emotions is you know, the, the many expectations that society has on men and the many masks we might wear to fit into those expectations. So that's what we're gonna really talk about today, dropping the masks, breaking out of expectations. And I'm really excited, my guest is a true warrior, Mr. Brandon Boucher. He's gonna share some of his experiences as a combat veteran, as an activist and a healer, and all that while he's created a life in alignment with who he truly is instead of what the world expects of him. So welcome to the show, Brandon. Thank you, Andy, thank you so much. Um, I find it really um, telling that the words that you actually used are obligation and duty uh, to to um, actually open up the the um, show. The, those are two um, things that I was raised with. Those were two expectations that were put on me as a child. I come from a from a military um, background. My grandfather served in World War II. My father served in Vietnam. Um, uh, they're growing up with that kind of expectation. There's a there's an there's an obligation to 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 be part of something greater than um, than who we are as individuals. So um, I find it very um, foretelling that <laughs> that uh, you can open open your show that way. Cool. And so so let's jump in and and even playing with 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 this word with this idea. Are any of the expectations that you grew up with that you could recognize? Are, are they? Are some negative or some positive? Do they all feel like a weight? Are you glad to have some of them? Um, I'm glad that I've had the experiences that I've had um, because they've they've made me who I am who I am today. Um, and to me, that's a very important um, aspect because the journey uh, as a human being walking this planet is varied for everybody. So um, even though I had those that duty, that obligation, um, I don't think I would change it because I don't know what the, what I would be like without those. Mm. No, I, I, I can agree with that. Cause even I see in my own life, like some of the horrible things, well, you know, I like where I am today. So I've got to appreciate all the good, bad and different things that got me here. Exactly. So exactly. And that's, and then, um, everybody says, uh, it's about the journey, not the, not the actual destination. So um, that's, I, I truly embrace that aspect of my life and who I am. Cool. So 
you know, the, the, the big focus of the show is, is about living in alignment. So could you share a bit about your life when you weren't living in alignment? <laughs> um, that's a broad question, but I can, I can start. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a there's a bunch of different aspects to my life where um what people expected me to do versus what i want to do are two very different things and um when you hear combat veteran or you hear activist you get a very distinct picture in your head of who and what i should be or how or how i should appear or what I should say, the words that come out of my mouth, even even the actual vocabulary. But um, I'm a, I, I like not being what people expect. I like being what I want to be. Okay. And what, were you always like that? Was, was that even as a child? Like, oh, I want to no. break out of these. No. No, no, no. Um, I was all. I tried to. I think that's probably the best way to um, actually say it is. I tried to go against what my programming or what I thought my my programming was. Um, uh, I was a little rebellious. I was a little bit. Um, I didn't do drugs. I really didn't drink until I was in high school. I, I think I was a junior in high school before I had my first drink. Um, never did drugs, um, but I was always. I was always pushing the bounds of what my mom, so my my um, mom and dad divorced when I was probably five or six. Um, I've had a couple of, um, of stepfathers in my life, but overall it's been my mom and my two sisters and I have been the, the um, family unit that I, that I grew, that I kind of um, grew up with. And growing up with three women um, is uh, a challenge for any, for, for any young, young male. Um, I didn't have much of a relationship with my dad, but my grandfather and I had a fantastic um, uh, relationship. He taught me how to, how to hunt, uh, how to build things. Like he was a real salt of the earth type, get your hands in the ground, plant, plant some crops, things like that. Um, so I learned a lot about what I thought a man should be from him. And uh, growing up with um, my grandmother was a um, was a alcoholic, um, and uh, that proved to be well. A couple of my stepfathers were alcoholics, things like that. So, so um, alcoholism was actually the very first, um, I guess, expectation. That I that I that I decided I didn't want to um, go to um, go into. So I was never a heavy drinker. I stopped drinking. Um, I would have maybe one beer like once or twice a week, um, and I never got into the hard stuff. I would party every now and then, um, but uh, I saw what alcoholism did to my family on both sides. Um, it, it's a very prevalent thing. It's a genetic disease that can be passed down. And I chose, I chose that I didn't want any of that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So, so I just, I, I really don't, I, I drink zero now. And I think the most I drank was when I was in, when, when I was in, when I was in the service, because that, that's kind of an expectation. I was in the Navy. So um, you pull into port, uh, you've got three days off, you're going to party and um, meet women and spend money. And that's, that's basically what we did for the first four years of my, um, of my naval, my, uh, my uh, Navy career. So, so you, it, it, it's such an interesting way to present that. And so I want to dig deeper the, the expectations of alcoholism. What was that? Do you think was that con conscious, subconscious? Well, I, I, I imagine your family wasn't saying, "Come on, Brandon, be an alcoholic." But, but how did that present itself? But um, the ritual of having alcohol at at family gatherings, um, at holiday seasons, uh, just coming home from work, and oh, well, you 
you had a hard day at work today, so you've earned a beer. You could crack open a beer. And, and um, I found that, that that that's a very slippery slope. A lot of my family nowadays, um, they can't they can't have an authentic relationship without or or they can't have an authentic experience without alcohol being being involved and to me that 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 really deadens the um the whole reason for being alive mm -hmm. is is we're supposed to experience these things and feel these um physical spiritual emotional ride um these actual roller coasters that we're on for uh for this this very brief period of time that we're on this planet for cool yeah um so, so my father was an alcoholic and his his grandfather was yeah alcoholism on on both sides of my family a, as well um and i was really from a very young age taught my, so my dad was involved in aa from as long as i can remember so i would just you know remember uh you know, that, that was bad. It's bad. It's bad. So I grew up very kind of anti, certainly very anti drug, but I did uh, drink from time to time. Um, and sometimes to, to self intentionally to self medicate and oh, yeah. to get drunk, to not feel whatever I was, was going on. Been um, there. <laughs> but it was, I remember, uh, it, it's funny that I, I distinctly remember, like, you know, I was in my mid thirties and I opened a refrigerator and it, there was all sorts of beers. I'm like, beers can stay here like what i no beer, you know beers come into the house and they get drunk until they're gone and then it's a new day like how how is this lasting how am i and i just realized wow i'm not i'm just not drinking it like i like i used to and it's just you know it, they just can sit around but in you know used to be you know one one's too many and you know ten's not enough that that was really my experience with it for a long time yep yep i can i can totally relate um so so uh i started uh, self the um self medicating aspect of it uh comes in after my um after my combat uh tour in in uh, I was about to say Vietnam I was like nope that's not correct uh, <laughs> um I was in um I was in Afghanistan from 2001 to 2003 and I worked with um with a joint with joint special operations command so uh, I was a I was a intelligence analyst so I worked with um, special forces. I worked with SEALs. I worked with force uh, with um, force recon. I worked with all of our um, joint our um, special oper our special operations communities in a combined team team um, team effort. And my primary role was was to provide actionable intelligence um, for. Um, for lack of a better term, uh, we went after high, um, high, high value targets, meaning um, cell leaders, um, uh, village, village, el uh, not elders, but um, warlords. That was the term. Um, we did a lot of um, hunting down terrorists, warlords, things like that, that, um, that were basically the dregs of society i mean these guys were just predators with a with a with a um with a capital p and uh some of the so as a intelligence analysis what my job was was to collect data in the form of video photo interviews all of these things so what i saw was some horrific scenes um uh, torture torture chambers um just uh um women children all of these things and uh that they, they they really haunted um haunted me after um after i got back but um i would have to basically go through all of this all of this intelligence make a prediction and within 36 hours we were either trying to kill or capture the um actual target that i that i actually put that that i actually put the um package uh package together for mm. wow so so what were the expectations around how you you dealt with that like were, were you were emotions allowed in in such a scenario not at all not at all in fact um uh you kind of go into into um 
into robot mode until until if if you're in the talk, which is the the tactical operations center, you're there. Um, all of the operators have um, video camera feeds coming into here so that um, you can see what mission they're on, what they're doing, and and if it was one of my profiles that I put together, then then I was in then then I was there. And the only time that you're really allowed to show emotion is when something unexpected happen uh, when something unexpected happens or the um, the um, mission's a success and the person dies. You you literally hear gunshots and um, and you hear Tango down, um, Geronimo down whatever that's a time where everybody cheers Woohoo! so you're actually celebrating the taking of another human's life which don't get me wrong i'm i i'm not i'm not saying what i did the people that we went after were truly evil people i mean the, they had no soul left in them the acts that they actually inflicted upon other 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 human beings, a quick death in my eyes at that time was way too good for them. Mm. But the emotion in in the talk when this happened was um, down to business. A, B, C, D, boom, we're done. Leave. And and it was wasn't until either after that they come back and the actual decompression happens, and that's whether you guys pop a beer. Uh, you you play cards, you weight lift, you exercise, whatever it is that um, kind of um, gives you the gives you the opportunity to uh, blow off steam, because because that 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 is a high pressure environment. Whether or not you're you're out in the field, you're providing support and intelligence. You're all you're all in the same mindset you're still in the same the job has to get done it's got to get done this way and this is right. how we're going to do it right so but so even the letting off steam wasn't ever really talking about wow what did we just do it was just like never yeah okay never that was um it was it was cool job's done blow off steam move on to the next one yeah. um we we never talked about well also, a lot of the work that I did was classified too. So, so um, you can't really talk. I mean, you literally can't talk about it. Right. Hmm. Now, from talking to you earlier, I I know that you said that uh, you have trouble hearing. Thank you for your service. Um, that is, yeah. Um, that's something that I've actually struggled with for quite a while. The um, when I first got back and I started hearing it in the um, I don't know. I guess mid two thousands or so when it first started started coming out, uh, it, it felt very hollow. I mean, it was it it was just kind of a. I I mean, at the time too, I I was like, how do you explain to somebody what my job actually was? Thank you for thank you for your going out and killing other human beings in defense of this country. Mm. Um, when when uh, so I can I can understand 9/11 or um, I can I can actually understand the early years of Afghanistan because of 9/11. Um, we we were attacked. We did lose human lives, and um, and uh, Osama bin Laden was responsible in. You have all of these conspiracy theories about how 9/11 was an was a actual inside job, so on and so forth. Planes still hit the World Trade Center. That that still happened. Nobody can really refute that. I mean, I've got eyewitness evidence of. I mean, there are people I know that were on the ground when that actually happened. So, um, was it an actual cover up for for other things as well? Did other things happen as a as a response to that or in 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 conjunction with that i don't i don't i don't really know what i do know is that uh 3000 over 3000 people lost their lives and um osama 
and Osama bin Laden was responsible for the financing and training of uh, some of those players. And and I felt I felt okay with um, with enacting some kind of retribution for that. Um, so when when I heard coming back, thank you for your service. Okay. I mean, it was a job. It was something that I felt like I had to do. It wasn't, um, it's not something that I was, um, I don't know. I, early on, I'm not sure exactly what my issue with, was, um, was with it. It was, I mean, it was my job. It was what I did at the time. So how, why are you, what, do you thank your husband for going into the office every morning? It's just it seemed it seemed like there was this major disconnect. And the more that I got involved with the with the veteran community, I really understand now what it means for them to hear thank you for your service. Um, I I went through a phase where I was like, okay, great, thank you, yep, not a problem. Where I just kind of brush it off, and now now it's really to the point of if I hear Thank you for uh, for your service. I will say um, you're welcome, and just kind of leave it at that. Because there are less than one percent of of um, of Americans that sign sign up to join the service. Now, the difference between now and I guess 20 years ago or so it was still is still the military industrial complex is now dictating a lot of what we're doing. Um, we have, we have wars that, like Afghanistan right now. I know that um, there are, there are, there, there are troops that are literally guarding poppy fields so that big pharma can have their opioid um, drugs. Um, back in 2004 to 2006, we had a burn in, a um, slash and burn policy for poppy fields and then helped and then paid 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 farmers to grow actual crops um, and then uh, that forced a spike in um, in in opioid prices and then they kind of reversed that policy and now have uh, troops actually um, guarding guarding poppy uh, plots and things like that where uh, it's just it's just the war has been going on for 17 years with no clear definition no plan to bring people home no clear definition for victory um, um, Osama bin Laden was killed back in 2000 what 2009 I think so so why are we still there um, and a lot of it is that if we pull out that the Taliban will actually come back because we've done a piss poor job of providing security and rebuilding infrastructure that we destroyed um, as as collateral damage. And that's it. it I mean, I could pontificate on this for hours. Um, it's just it's just. Um, I, yeah. So back to your original question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was really hard to hear. Thank you for um, your service, because I have so many emotions about what happened. Um, yeah. I've I, I've lost more friends that I served with, more more of my of my brothers and 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 sisters have died since they've come back because of drugs, alcohol, and um, lack of proper um, proper medical care and being part of the 22 veteran suicides at um, a day than I than I than I than I ever lost in combat right. and to me that's a that's a um, that's more than a tragedy that's a I mean I don't I don't I don't have a word to describe how 
how horrific I think that is. And yeah. part of that is because the fact that um, when you go into the service, emotions are really taken out of you. They're really, you're, you're, you're torn down in basic training lasts between two and three months, depending on which branch of the, of the service you go into. And they tear you down to your raw human essence and then rebuild you the way that they need you to be. Very, um, yes, yes, sir, no, sir, um, toe the line. This is, this is what we, this is how we need you to be. You can't be a free thinker. You can't, um, you follow tradition and you follow military procedure and that's how things get done. But then um, when you transition out of the service, you have a three-day class called TAPS, which is tr uh, Transition Assistance Program. And basically you're going from serving, whether it's, whether it's four years of service to 30 years of service, you're getting the same exact information without any of these services or programs being 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 offered to help you really um reacclimate to civilian life um prisoners talk about um coming out of prison where they can't go to the bathroom without asking permission they can't do this without asking permission and it's not very dissimilar from what um veterans being being separated from services uh, experience as well. Yeah. So you, the way you phrase, it, I think you said that, that the service removes your emotions, mm -hmm. but I mean, I, 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 from my perspective, that, I mean, that's not really possible. So, I, or is it more that they train you to bury them or train you to believe they've been removed? Um, it's more that um, they, they train you to not, emotions are, Irrelevant and can actually be a detriment. Hmm. So you turn off those emotions um, when you need to. And um, it gets to a point where if you keep turning them off, turning them back on, it becomes harder and harder. Right. And I always, so I, I've never served. And, but I always wondered, like, you know, the basic training is, you know, we, we teach you to you know, be rather inhuman to not be emotional, to, to kill on command and to not have repercussions. And then when it's over, yeah, I didn't, it's, there's nothing like, here's, here's how to feel again. That, that there's part no, doesn't happen. Yeah. There's no, um, there's a, there's a movement now for, um, for veterans to um, actually have the Department of, of Defense Institute, a um, unboot camp or, or a um, reverse boot camp program. Uh, and, um, there are quite a few activists that are, that are working to bring about that, that change, but, or, or yeah, that change. But again, it's, if it's a voluntary program and you're in for, for even three years and you've seen combat, you're, you are so emotionally stunted and so emotionally scarred. I mean, taking a human life, no matter how evil the act is or them shooting at you or whatever the circumstances are, it's an unnatural act. I mean, it just, it is. And, and, and the fact that uh, they say that um, the first one is always the hardest. And uh, I believe that to be true. I, I don't know because I've never actually pulled a trigger on someone, but I feel that I am that I am responsible for over three dozen deaths because it was my intelligence package and my signature that said, this guy's a target, bring him. And I was in the talk for every single mission. So, I mean, even though I didn't pull the trigger, the person died because of what I, because of what I actually put together. So was it that the the waste of losing so many more people since their service than than during it, and the, this uh, lack of help to have you turn your emotions back on? Is are these sort of the things that that led you to become more of an activist and, and working with veterans more? Um, I think that's part of it. 
and that's <sighs> this country has changed a lot since my service um and i think that was and that was one of the the driving goals for me at first was this is not the country that i signed up for when um when we have uh corporate interests being being um catered to over that of human rights or even treaty right interests so um i became really active with the with the um veteran stand for standing rock um movement back in the late 2016 winter um uh, i remember uh i I had followed the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. This is with um, with the um, with the uh, uh, Dakota Access Pipeline and and Energy Transfer Partners, and the fact of their employing um, ex-military and military contractors for security and PR programs for uh, for suppressing human rights. Uh, Human rights, civil rights, cons constitutional rights, and treaty rights. Um, as we, as we, when you're in the military and you and you take that oath of of service, we swear to protect and and defend the constitution of the United States against all enemies, both foreign and and domestic. And um, that oath even though you get out of the service for 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 me and i have found since a lot of my fellow veterans that's that's an oath that as long as there's lungs in our breath that's something that we hold sacred almost and to see where the country has gone in this time uh corporate interests take take um take precedent over human lives doesn't matter what it is and the constitution holds treaties to be the supreme law of of the of the land uh unless it appears to be with native american or indigenous peoples um because uh, out of the 146 treaties that we have signed with 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 indigenous peoples we haven't we haven't upheld a single one of them so so that got me really involved with that and my activism within the veteran community has kind of grown to deal with um deported veterans to bring to 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 bring awareness to the fact that we have um we have over over 400 pe people that have served and been honorably discharged that are then deported back to their home countries when um service was was a clear path for for citizenship in this country um i've also worked with um with um minority veterans um uh um lbgtq rights to uh to kind of get them recognized uh the the amazing thing about the um veteran community is that there is a um, microcosm of the world of even even the actual country veterans are as diversified as the US is a is a melting pot so any social issue that we see in um, society can also be be um, be reflected in the in the military so um that community i mean there's um women's rights there's um uh black lives matter even even they say that um some people will say that um when you're in the service the only color that they see is green or blue or or um whatever your branch is known for um, and that's just not true. That's a that's a very a very ignorant statement, because um, because be, because military life um, filters and magnifies what is 
what is on a societal level too. Uh, so um, white supremacy has been has been on the rise in um, um, military ranks um, for probably the last uh, 25 years. Um, and and the funny thing is is that we'll see issues in um, the military that come out before they come out in society because of the the um, micro version of of um, the world that we kind of belong to there. Hmm. Wow. So what what are some of the expectations of being an activist that that you break? Um, angry at the world, always, always, um, always railing, always, uh, you know, the only thing that I can change is I can change myself and, um, I can bring awareness to other aspects, but I can't change anybody's mind. And the only way that I can, the, the way that I've found that my, um, activism takes takes form is that I do the work that actually fulfills me. Um, I've, I have, um, I have helped organize protests and, um, you know, it's funny. <laughs> you can be angry at things that are, that are, um, actually going on, but the moment that you cross that line of anger into, uh, I found that a lot of activists want to become the story so that um, they can amplify their message and um, actually get it out. And what that actually does is that vilifies the movement that you're trying to actually do. Um, and it, it it's really difficult to kind of come back from that. It, it's, it's um, oh, well, look at these people. Uh, they um, took to the streets and threw rocks at cops and um, burned down buildings and it just became a riot. Once that happens, any message that, that, uh, that, uh, you are trying to actually get across is gone. You, you have lost all credibility. So, um, what I do now is, um, I hold, um, I hold, uh, meditative, um, protests where, um, uh, we're planning one in the spring where we go to the, um, to the, um, state house and we do a, um, kind of like people doing a silent candlelight vigil. This will be a meditative vigil for, um, I, I'm not even sure which, uh, which thing we're going to be doing it for yet, but, um, I'm, I am actually facilitating that aspect of it. Um, I have given speeches in front of 2000 people. Um, and, uh, it's just righteous anger is never the way to really make absolute change. You need to have no good change is ever going to come out of anger. So you need to find a way that will, um, allow you to channel that anger and transmute it and transform it into something that's restorative and healing for the collective as a whole. So it really sounds like you've, uh, well, you've, you've, you're living in life, you've got it all together, you figured out what, what brings you fulfillment and everything and, and you're taking actions on it. But you know, what, was it an easy, graceful transition from Afghanistan to discovering these causes you cared about? Uh, no, no. Um, I had a lot of anger when I came back. I had a lot of anger, a lot of hurt. Um, every time that I went to a funeral of somebody that I served with, I just got angrier and angrier. Um, I say that when I was in, when, when I was in Afghanistan, I looked into the face of evil and I saw that it looked back at me. That's a very profound thing to have happen. And I figured that since we live in a world of duality, or we live in a world of polarities, really, if there is this much evil over here, there has to be good somewhere. There has to be this counterbalance of 
what does it look like to combat this evil? Because obviously killing it is not an option the way the conventional way that a soldier or sailor or military minded person thinks. Um, and that started me on a journey of trying to find, I mean, I literally, I, I mean, I saw like the black eyes and I felt this, 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 this presence. And I'm like, okay, there has to be some kind of counterbalance here. So the first thing that I really looked into was religion. I was like, okay, if there's this evil and it's being controlled on such a, such a level that I can't comprehend what that actually means. Maybe there's something out here. So I was raised a Christian and I took Christian, I took my faith in Christianity about as far as I wanted to actually take it. Um, when the, when the um, hypocrisy starts uh, at a very young age, um, uh, like my sister was raped by one of my, um, one of my best friends who happened to be the son of an elder in our church. And she was punished for allowing it to happen. I, I couldn't, I could no longer really stand behind the fact that this is something that is, this is, this is not of the loving God that I've been told exists. Mm. Um, so I went and I read and tried to experience everything that I could from, um, I studied, um, I've studied Islam, I've studied Judaism, I've studied, um, uh, Norse, Norse pagan practices. I've studied, um, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Zor Zoroastrianism. Uh, Shinto, I mean, anything that I could get my hands on, I looked for, and I was like, I was like, okay, I would, I would take bits and pieces, but the common thread that I found through all of it was that there really was this underlying human, human aspect to it that was used as a, as a fear tactic control. I, it really felt like I was, I was back in a lot of my of of the um of the military mindset of you can't do this because this will happen you can't do this because this will happen you can't do this because this will happen and it was a lot of fear it was a lot of control it really seemed the more that i dug into where the bible came from um studied my my actual gnostic gospels all of these things it's just it really showed me that religion is a construct of man and um what I was looking for was something much deeper. Um, I, uh, the closest I came to it was when I started studying um, Wiccan when I was in college. Um, it, it was a Celtic-based, nature-based view that while people called it a, a religious view, it really wasn't. It was more of a spirituality. It was, it was more of getting in touch with nature and um, the cycle of life that there's a birth there's a death there's a there's a there's a um rebirth and just things keep on going in in that cycle and that was the closest thing that i found where you take the human out of out of nature really and it's and it, and and it's getting back to the prime to to the primordial essence of what it means to be human by contrasting yourself with nature so you've had this experience of looking at evil coming home and kind of having residual effects still losing people being very angry and and you're so you're in search of good and yep. So where did you eventually find it? How did you discover that you, that you were more than anger? <laughs> um, so I kind of had a really um, interesting experience with meditation back in 2014, I think, maybe 13. I don't actually rub, I don't remember the actual year. I just, it, it uh, was kind of a blur, but um so in 2007, I was di I I was diagnosed with moderate PTSD, uh, which 
um, which isn't as as severe as some. So um, what I would experience with that was I would be triggered really easily. Somebody cut me off in traffic and I would just explode. It was, um, I would do stupid, stupid, reckless things. Uh, somebody says something to me in like, I could go from zero to in your face, yelling and screaming without really a thought as to, whoa, how did, how did, how did, how did I get here? It, it really was a triggering event. And I tried everything. I tried equine therapy. I tried canine therapy. I tried art therapy. I tried group therapy, peer therapy, like everything that I could, because, because I knew that I didn't want to live this way, but I also recognized the fact that I couldn't fix this on my own. Self-medication wasn't working. I wasn't going to take any, any drugs because I, because drugs didn't make me drugs dr in my mind, drugs did not get me to this spot. Therefore, they're not going to get me out of the spot. The, they will cover up the effects, and they may, and they may um, uh, divert the effects. But the actual underlying wounding is still there. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, this was 2007. I tried a bunch of things through the VA, outside of the VA, and then a friend of mine came to me, and she's like, "Hey, I met this guy. He does this." meditation thing do you want to come and come and try and at the time i was single i i had tried a bunch of i tried um transcendental meditation and i and i and i tried some form of shamanic meditation and they didn't really work like like they didn't have that i didn't have the effect that this ended up having on me but she was cute and i was single and i was like sure why not um so uh, I ended up ended up going to uh, the Greater Boston Center for Spiritual Training and Healing, I think is what it was called originally. Um, and I had and I, I was like, all right, fine. Um, I meet Jordan Jordan Bain there, and we're gonna do this thing that's called Max Meditation. Which is a five-part guided, guided um, shamanic experience. I was like, "All right, great." Um, but I was there, and she was there, and I was like, "Cool, this is something that she likes. Maybe I'll like it." Whatever. So, um, it's a it's a sixty to to ninety minute meditation, and I had a profound experience the very first time I tried it. I was able to actually drop in. My mind quieted. The rage that I felt underneath me, uh, I felt that flame just kind of die down. And I felt, for the first time in a very long time, I felt peace. Um, and I and I really had this amazing journey throughout the whole time. And at the end of it, I was just like, this, this, this is amazing. I need to learn how to actually do this. And that's when Jordan and I talked about the path of progression and um, so on and so forth. Uh, I'll get into more of that later. But um, through through this experience, uh, this was every Friday. So um, I started coming regularly, and then I asked Jordan. Um, I was like, I was like, okay, this is really, really actually helping me. Are there parts of this that I can that I can incorporate in my day? He goes. Sure, just do the body relaxation and do the sitting in light for 20, 20 to 30 minutes a day, and, and uh, you should see some pretty spectacular results. Or you could see results. He didn't guarantee anything. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so nine months later, I go back to see my, my clinician for, for, my, for my annual follow-up, and she hands me my PTSD checklist, and I go through it. And she's asking me questions and things like that. And then, and then, and then she grades this piece of paper and she kind of stops and she looks at me and she goes, here, you want to fill out another one of these? I'm like, all right. And I went through and I, and I filled it out again. And she just looks at me and she's like, what have you been doing differently? I was like, what do you, what do you mean? I haven't done anything differently. She goes, no, no, no you've done something different. Um, she, what is it? I was like, I, I, 
I don't know. She, she goes, well, you've gone from a 70, so the PTSD scale goes from one to, one to 26. 26 being the most severe that um, you have that you need to, uh, you might need actual inst inst institutionalization to actually deal with. I was at a 17, so I was I was I was above, I was above moderate, but not by much. Um, she's she she's like you went from a 17 to a two in nine months. I was like, um, okay, what's that mean? She goes, well, it's impossible. Uh, I've, I've not seen this ever happen before. So what have you been doing differently? I said, I've been doing any, well, I did this meditation thing and she goes, okay, tell me about it. So I told her about the journey and the weekly thing and how I would probably do the body relaxation and the light, um, two or two or three times a week. And, um, she, and then she looks at me and she's like, you don't have PTSD anymore. I was like, what? Nobody. Nobody heals PTSD. And um, yeah, so she, she, the the funny thing was she looks at me and, and says, okay, when is the last time you had a triggering incident? I was like, oh, I just had one. And I actually had to stop. And I went back in my mind for nine months. Hmm. I'm like, hold on. And I wasn't tricked, like my last triggering incident was like the day that I went to my first meditation. So it was at that point that I just started, I started looking at everything that I could. Um, I talked to um, Sarah, Sarah Lazur, who is at the um, Harvard, Harvard, uh, Harvard Institute of Psychiatric Studies. And um, she's, she's a, She's a neuroscientist who did a 12-week study that showed that 12 that 12 weeks of uh, meditation, 20 to 30 minutes a day, helped re regrow gray gray matter in the brain. What it actually did um, in her studies and her actual and in her subsequent studies was it re it re rooted neural pathways in the brain. Uh, and um, sloughed off or actually reabsorbed the ones that were no longer active, that were no longer working. So basically, you, re, you reprogrammed and regrew your thought patterns yeah. through meditation. And I thought that this, this was a profound, like, I'm like, I'm like, how come nobody has talked about this? How come nobody's done this? What, what is going on? So um, I went, uh, I learned how to become a, Max Meditation Facilitator. Um, I went through uh, through the through the modern through the modern the modern mystery school and their um, and their uh, eight thousand years of unbroken lineage uh, training. Um, it's been and through this particular, uh, I'm not even sure what to call it other than. Uh, through the through the through the method, methodologies of this schooling and the classes and things that I have taken, uh, it really it 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 has truly made the biggest difference in my entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I came back, I put together this entire study, um, and I was like, I want to offer max meditation to 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 veterans within the veteran uh, with 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 in the VA system, um, so that we can actually track and see what the what the benefits are. Like, I literally wrote up this this entire this entire proposal, and I went to my local VA. My clinician was like, "Hey, um, let me set up a." meeting with you with our uh, chief of staff of research and we'll see what we can do. And he came back and he said, well, it sounds really interesting, but we don't have funding for it. Uh, or if you want funding, you're gonna have to write a grant for it. it. He didn't, he really didn't even see, he was so concerned about the money aspect of it that he really didn't even listen to um, 
to the actual proposal or or what the what 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 the aims of of the study actually were he's like we don't have random people off of the street coming in and saying hey give me funding to run this study he's like i was like i was like the fact that i'm a veteran and that i've been through this and that this actually works that should give me some credence and some quality well you don't have a you don't have an md after your after your name you don't have a phd after your name so it's just like all right screw you i'm going to do this on my own um so i got together with some other modern mystery school um facilitators and put together a program to do max meditation for veterans um all over the country uh just privately held um and i found out early on that uh without me being directly involved it really didn't like like I would have to be there, speak to veterans groups, tell them my story in person to really get them involved and to, and to actually get them to buy in. Um, and that was cost, that was cost prohibitive. That, that just there, um, it, it really didn't, didn't work out. So what I ended up doing was I've been telling my story about how this has worked for me and, and I kind of put out the the actual invitation that hey, if you want to make a change and you want something to um, be different, then I challenge you to actually do this. And it's amazing when you actually use use the words "I challenge you," yeah. because that right there is a very manly uh, manly uh, thing that actually elicits a program response, especially amongst veterans. There's, there's a, there's a high, there's a high competition, um, uh, mentality, I guess it's probably a really good term. So, um, doing that is, is, is really, I found that that's actually helped, um, bring a few people in. No one is really dedicated. I've not found anyone that's truly dedicated themselves the way that I did to actually doing it. But every single veteran that I have actually held meditation for, they have been, um, uh, there's been some kind of result and it's always been on the positive side. I've never had, had anybody come in. Actually, I can't say that. I did have somebody come in who was just angry the entire time. And, um, sat down with him one on one afterwards and found out that there were uh, there were a few other things that he needed before he could really step into this aspect of it and and one of the big things was coming to terms with the fact that he's not broken and um that's part of i found that that that's one of the big aspects that um veterans have is um I'm broken. Something's wrong with me. I shouldn't feel this way. Right. Um, it's me. It's me. It's me. And while to a certain degree it is you, but it's it is it is based upon your experiences, and it can be changed. There's nothing. There is there is nothing keeping you within that box box except for yourself. Right. It's almost as if that's become another expectation of the troubled veteran that I'm broken. I can't be fixed. There's no help for me. Yes. That, um, yeah, that's a, that's a very, um, it, that's if they can even get to the point that they're broken. Um, there is the other aspect of it of nothing's wrong with me. Yeah. I'm, I'm so what if I'm angry? I'm just, I'm an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> it's right. And, I, and, and I'm not. I'm not broken. This, this is just who I am, and deal with exactly, it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And and uh, you get to deal with me, or or you're not a part of my life. And that's and that's and that's and that's another aspect that people, or that even people, not just veterans, have to come to terms with the fact that um, there's nothing that we that we as human beings that this is a miraculous vessel that we have and there's nothing that we can't we can't heal from whether it's the psychological trauma the physical trauma um trauma can be healed and that starts in 
that starts a very hard yet profound process when that actually happens. Right. Yeah, it's often it can uh, it can feel safer to say, well, it can't be healed. This is how I am. You know, it can be easier to to trick ourselves into thinking we can't do something. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's kind of that um, that um, victim mentality of, well, it's it is it is easier for me to wallow in my own shit than it is to figure out a way out of it. Right. And that's, and, and, and when, when that aha moment happens of, wait, you mean I don't have to live like this, that I can, I can shift towards something better. Uh, that just, that makes this work so worthwhile. You know, it's a uh, another um, amazing synchronicity. I share everyone that 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 we met through the Modern Mystery School, and um, exactly two years ago today, Jordan Bain was a guest on this show. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. So if anyone wants to know more about the the Modern Mystery School and, and Jordan, you've heard his name mentioned um, today. Uh, it's it's it was episode forty back in December of twenty sixteen. So. And I, and I'll put a link to that in the uh, in the show notes uh, of this one. But uh, yeah, I was like, wow, we're um, I just found that very interesting. I know that's yeah, that's remarkable. Yeah. Um. Yeah. yeah. Jordan is Jordan has been a um a guiding factor in in um helping me get back to who 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 I am, but also empowering me to take the steps that I need to. Um, and that's been truly healing um, for uh, for me, and and it's actually given me the power and the ability to go to other um, other uh, other veterans uh, that have that have been suffering as well to um, to uh, start their own healing process if that's what they want. Right. So I wonder how, how does how does thanking you for your service feel now or after after you lead max meditation for a group of vets and someone says thank you for your service is is it different? It's very different. Um, I say I say you're welcome because now I don't look at my as it as being part of my um, as just my actual military service. I actually look at it as my service to humanity, yeah. and 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 that's what I that's what I'm continuing to actually do. So, so I was raised on a life of, a life of service. Uh, my grandfather, my, um, all of my uncles, they were volunteer firefighters. My mom was a actual EMT. I became in, I became a lifeguard when I was 16. I became a EMT, a paramedic, volunteer firefighter. And I just joined the, joined the military as kind of that progression of service to something greater than myself so when somebody says thank you for your service now i just say thank you because i i'm still continuing to serve humanity even today yeah yeah and not even it, it, from my perspective you're serving humanity more today not not oh even today it's it's even more it, it's more beneficial I, more uplifting service I would agree with that because um, because the work that I do spans it crosses uh, it crosses ethnic lines it crosses national lines it crosses gender lines it brings us back to that 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 humanness that that bit of who we are um, at our core level and that's what we need to get back to is the fact that I'm not an American I'm not a man I'm not I'm not a, a a white Anglo-Saxon male. Um, I am a human being, and when I can connect with other human beings on that on that level, seeing past the color of their skin, their gender, their religion, whatever, and just see the humanness of them, um, that to me is the biggest service I can actually give on this planet during during my brief tenure here i love it i love it so thank you for your service <laughs> you are very welcome andy and and thank you for yours because you're doing the same thing yeah and you know just to kind of to wrap it up you know it so 
to me, through the course of this conversation, it really feels like the, the, the notion of, of living in alignment is recognizing and accepting your, your humanity, right? That all the other labels and expectations and mass, whatever you want to call them, that it's all superfluous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. At the core, you're human. And as all human beings feel fulfilled by being of service to others. And if you don't, you should look at why. Hmm. Because, because as human beings, and, and, you know, as a veteran, I was taught the person on your left, the person on your right are the, are the most important people at that particular moment in time um, that you have to, you're not fighting for a flag. You're not fighting for a, for a, for a actual, a actual country. You're fighting so that this person can go back to their family. This person can go back to their family and they're doing the same thing. And, um, you know, that's, that's a lesson that should permeate through throughout our entire life not end with all of the relationships that we have not just in the service because the person that i walk down the street and i pass and i smile i don't know what they're going through but i'm wishing them um all of the joy and happiness that uh that that they that they actually deserve and if they're having a problem and they want my help or they want to figure out how they can get beyond what they, then I'm going to stop and I'm going to serve them. It doesn't matter where they are or, or, um, or um, even who they are. I want them to get back to their human family. The fact that, that we are all connected by this, by this moment in time of being on this planet at this particular moment as this particular vessel for whatever our purpose is, because we all have a very unique purpose. And most of humanity has no idea how to find out what that purpose is. And if I can help them in some little way, then I'm going to do that. Beautiful. So what, what's the best way for people to, to get in touch with you, to reach out, to, to learn more about you and your purpose? Uh, right now, so um, the best way to get in touch uh, is uh, my my wife and I, my beautiful wife, Caitlin, who I met doing this work. Um, we have a healing practice uh, and a and a Facebook page called K and B Healing, where we're actually in the process of redoing our our um, website. But if you want some more information, you can also email us at info at kbhealing.com great so i will uh we'll have links to the the email and to the facebook page on the show notes for this on the good men project and at realmenfield.org huh fantastic cool um thank you for your journey thank you for continuing to to dive into it and to uh to go deeper and more service, more growth, more discoveries. Um, I think you're, you are an outstanding human being <laughs> and I really appreciate your time being here. Andy, thank you so much for, um, for, for actually inviting me. And I'm glad that we could actually connect now. I mean, I know that we tried like a month ago and uh, it just, it's, it, it just didn't work out, but I, I thank you for giving me the the platform and the actual opportunity to to um, reach out to people that may that may or may not know that uh, there there is a way to live your life to your fullest potential and it starts with a conversation mm, beautiful. and it starts with conversations like this between two guys yeah just because we're just we're 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 really just two two human beings yeah yeah the, the more you're willing to share you know have what may feel like a difficult conversation at times that's there's more life on the other side of that there 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 always is and um we have more in common than we have us as human beings share more in common with each other than we do the actual differences. But right now with the climate of the world that we live in, 
we all focus on what those actual differences are instead of what the commonalities are. Mm -hmm. And 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 when we can flip that and look at the at the commonalities, that gives me real hope for future generations and future the future of humanity itself. Yeah. Cool. So here's to hope. <laughs> here's to hope. All right. Thank you again, Brandon. Thanks for everyone for joining us today. Um, wherever you're listening to us, give us a share, uh, a recommendation, a rating, a review, a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Visit realmenfield.org. Check us out on Facebook. Send us feedback, and we'll talk to you again soon. Be good to yourself. See ya. Thank you for listening to Real Men Feel. Reach out to us at realmenfeel at gmail.com. Learn more about Andy Grant at theandygrant.com. Until next time, visit realmenfeel.org or the Real Men Feel Facebook group and share what you thought of this episode. Please give this podcast a review on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you are discovering Real Men Feel. Visit goodmenproject.com for more of the conversations no one else is having.